Hi, I'm Jim Lucott from the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology, and I assume that by this point in the course, you have already been given a description of how the chemical warfare nerve agents work and what the physical symptoms are. What I'm going to talk to you about is the countermeasures that we have in place to treat people who are affected by this type of poisoning. And the backbone of the whole system is the Army's Mark I field kit. Um, each soldier in the field carries three of these units. They can be self-administered or given to somebody else. The key component is the atropine auto-injector. Each auto-injector has a spring-loaded 18-gauge needle that's designed to go through full combat field gear and deep into the thigh muscle. I've been told that this is a very unpleasant experience. And if you have to take up to three kits, um, you're going to be a very unhappy person. The atropine is the key. Atropine blocks the muscarinic receptors and it's the main function that's going to keep you alive because most of the time you die from peripheral effects. The atropine will block the bronchoconstriction and reduce the amount of bronchial secretions so you can maintain air passage. It'll also block the explosive um, salivation that occurs which can also interfere with your ability to breathe. Um, it has other protective effects on the digestive system, uh, but right now the issue is to keep the soldier alive. The second thing it does is it acts in the central nervous system up here by the piriform cortex where it prevents the development of seizures, which is the second major problem that you get with organophosphate poisoning. The second component of the kit is a larger one, and this is 2-PAM. This is uh, the agent that the United States chose as a regenerative agent. In other words, it reaches into the acetylcholinesterase molecule and actually shoulders aside the chemical warfare agent before it has a chance to covalently bond and therefore completely kill the enzyme. Um, it's not uniformly effective across all chemical warfare agents. So for example, you'll see that the British use, um, I think they use HI6 which is better against Soman, and the Eastern European blocks use a product called Hilo, which has a more general effect um, across all agents. The third uh, component to the treatment will soon be issued to the soldiers, but is currently carried by the medics, and that's an injectable diazepam, again an auto-injector sample. The idea behind the diazepam is if these have not sufficiently uh, prevent the development of seizures, the injection of um, diazepam will prevent the seizures from either developing uh, any further or it can actually in some cases terminate the seizures. Now, there are a few problems with what we have available for the battlefield. The first problem is that um, after 30 minutes, none of the benzodiazepines are effective. So that if the medic is not available and they've not yet issued the diazepam kits, any soldier who begins to seize is going to be stuck with seizures. The second drawback in the field is the um, regenerative com compound. We're still searching for one which is more uniformly effective across all chemical warfare agents. Um, the second thing that we want to change in that regenerator is we want one that gets into the brain. Uh, I mean, after all, brain acetylcholinesterase is pretty doggone important to functioning too. But the biggest problem that the military has is with the atropine, because atropine itself is an incapacitating agent. And in fact, I have to keep these kits under lock and key 24-7. What the atropine does, in addition to supporting respiration, uh, it has effects on the eye. One of them is good. Uh, the chemical warfare agent causes spasm of accommodation so that the lens of your eye is squeezed in a painful fashion. After you take atropine, that's reduced, but the problem is that now you have a fixed and dilated pupil. So if you could imagine and you're in a desert environment, um, for example, these lights now would be unbearably painful. Uh, I once had a colonel explain to me that he was more afraid of the Mark I kit than he was of a chemical warfare attack. And, he's, and I was surprised, you know, I mean, gee, nerve cast, that's scary. He said, could you imagine 2,000 armed to the teeth, terrified young kids that can barely see? They just see vague shapes moving. 
He said, I don't want to be anywhere near those guys. <laughs> and I see their point. So uh, we are working on developing a replacement for the atropine. Now, when you get to the civilian scenario, you have to think differently because the soldier is carrying these kits in their pockets. If a terrorist launched an attack such as occurred in Japan with the uh, Tokyo subway, it's going to take at least 30 or 40 minutes before the first responders can get there. If they have sufficiently pure material and are effective in dispersing it, you've already got a bunch of dead people. You have people who are ex exhibiting the symptoms and may soon die, and for those the Mark I kit may be effective, but for those who have already into seizures, you may not be able to protect them in time with diazepam. So here we have a mass casualty situation with few responders and comparatively small amounts of these, uh, these kits. Now, the kits are carried by first responders. They're also in medical emergency repositories, both in regional and local levels. For example, the local police department has access to um, a locker that'll have maybe 50 kits and a bunch of other first aid type supplies. But from the civilian scenario, we're gonna be mostly dealing with the people who survived the initial attack and who now are going to suffer long-term consequences. So sure, the Mark I kit can control the anticholinergic effects, keep them alive until we can get them into supportive care, but if they're seizing or, or if they have any other central nervous system long-term consequences, there's a good chance that the person may become permanently debilitated and therefore add to our long-term medical burden. Right now, the civilian sector is um, getting very um, strongly involved in the military's new thrust to develop what they call neuroprotectants. And the idea of a neuroprotectant is that it gets past the mechanism of the acetylcholine, it gets past the mechanism causing the seizures, but goes all the way down to the cell level near the last few steps that cause cell death. And if we could find something that works at that point, we may be able to provide complete protection from neurodegeneration up to perhaps two or three hours after the original poisoning. Um, on uh, just a general note, I should add that um, we live in southwest Ohio, which is an agricultural community, and the pesticides that they spray on the fields in the short term are every bit as dangerous as the chemical warfare agents. Uh, so if someone were to get a crop duster and put a really good concentrated uh, amount into mister, he could create a good deal of mischief as something like a gabal game. Uh, and again, you would have first responders being able to use the Mark I kit uh, to help to um, prevent the casualties from getting any worse. Thank you.